Man. Boys and girls, you are listening and watching my good pal Alicia Sweeney from Indy 1023 in Colorado. The best. Hi. And that, my friends, that is Adam Wiener of Low Cut Connie. And you are joining us for another Indy 1023 session at home. For those that aren't in the club. Low Cut Connie, this is a band for the people fronted by Mr. Wiener right here. He takes us to church two times a week with his live streams and him and his band also put out a double album this year called Private Lives back in October. Hey Adam, good to see you. What's up? How you doing babe? I miss, I miss coming out there to uh, Colorado where we have the wildest shows that we ever have are always out there with you guys. Oh my God, Denver loves you so much and we miss you and we're just, you know, staying afloat just like you are there trying to bring good music to the good people who want it and everything. And, and I want to take a moment and look at the timeline of your year. So it kind of started off, you were doing some solo shows by February, one of your fans, Sylvester Stallone, was like showing off his low-cut Connie sweatshirt, which, <laughs> which that doesn't surprise me. You've got fans like we've talked about in the past, Barack Obama, Elton John, pretty much Rolling Stone worships the feet that you, your feet, man, Rolling Stone. Yeah, but you know, Sly, Sly was extra special because I live in South Philly. I live in the neighborhood where Rocky was filmed. And, you know, that's like getting blessed by the Pope. You know, Sly in South Philly is, is as big as you can be. So when I got a message that said, you know, can you send Mr. Stallone a uh, sweatshirt? He loves the band. And we have a song called Shake It Little Tina oh, yeah. that mentions Sly Stallone for a second in it. I, I say, I do all the macho, macho things, Sly Stallone and chicken wings. And he liked that, so he took a picture on set with the sweatshirt, and that was pretty. That was pretty cool. Well, I hope he wears it, you know, still and rocks it. So then March happens as we look at the timeline of the year of you guys as a band. The country's quarantined. There's stay-at-home orders, and then I gotta say, you were like a musical first responder, reaching your audience online. You, March 19th, I had to take a look back. That's when you did your first live show to help us get through it and to just sit and have a moment of distraction from what was going on at the time and, and what is still going on. So thank you for that. March 19th, um, my life changed that day. All of our lives changed that week, but, um, you know, I, I, I never thought that I would be sitting here, um, you know, nine plus months later and still running around in my underwear in my house uh, for thousands of people on the internet. Um, I thought I was going to do one weekend. I mean, I thought that we'd go live in my house on the Thursday and the Saturday. And I don't think any of us knew how long, you know, this crisis would last and how long we'd be quarantined. And the, the evidence of that, Alicia, if you remember, March 19th, I don't know about Colorado, but in Philadelphia, we had been on lockdown for less than two weeks. I mean, it was like yeah. 10 days. It was like yeah, 10 days. <laughs> and at that point, there was this feeling of I can't take it anymore from everybody that, that I know. Mm -hmm. And isn't that quaint uh, that we all, you know, we, we couldn't stand 10 days trapped at home. We've been doing this almost a year. We're going to continue to do it, which shows us, by the way, we're stronger than we know we are, right? Right, right. But after 10 days, uh, I was laying around just like everybody else. Uh, depressed, just thinking, I don't know what's going to happen. And I knew that we were, I was about to go to South by Southwest and announce, um, put, put out the first single of the album and uh, doing my solo concerts. I had some concerts here in Philly that were sold out and, and they all went away, but that wasn't the concern. The concern was like, 
are people that I know going to pass away? Are people that I know going to get ill? Uh, where are we headed? Yeah. And of course, like many of us, I was missing any kind of leadership on the federal level as to what to expect and what the right thing to do was. It's very frustrating. So after a week of laying around, I said, I got to do something. I got to do something. And our fans were like, can you just go live on Instagram or Facebook for like 20 minutes and do something? And uh, the first show on the 19th, Will Donnelly, my guitar player in Low Cut Connie and I, the two of us, we just sat down. We had no plan, no set list, nothing. And all I know is after an hour, I was basically mm -hmm. naked and and covered in sweat. And I don't hear applause or laughter. Or <laughs> I don't know if anybody's watching. You know, I'm performing to four walls. Yeah. And so we, we, we log off and I said, was anybody watching? And uh, this woman that, that I love who was working for me with the cell phones, she said, we had tens of thousands of people watching <laughs> around the world. And we had, I think, 4,000 comments and it was in different languages and people had said things like i haven't felt alive in a while uh, so i said all right we're going to do it again saturday and on saturday we had 125,000 people watching and the washington post sent a photographer with a mask outside my house to photograph and it just sort of took off alicia i didn't even have a name for it until the second or third week i named it tough cookies but there was no plan and um there's never been a plan i'm just walking on a tightrope and making it up as i go along well thank god we have you you're like mr empathy or mr preacher mm. lifting us up a couple times a week which i think has been so mm. incredible and how do you stay upbeat during this time i know i have to, i know that i have a job to do yeah. And, you know, I think all of us have a deep appreciation during this time for purpose and the purpose that we're missing, especially for those of the around us that have lost a job or mm -hmm. lost whatever their, their daily or weekly function is. Um, you lose a sense of purpose. And so having, well, you know, once I saw these videos that people sent us of them watching the live stream with their children like little kids or with their with their grandparents and then we got videos of nurses watching in the ICU we had people with covid watching in in the hospitals in their beds we had people from around the world and people would screen the live stream on the side of a building so that they could watch with their neighbors outside mm -hmm. and i saw the uh, therapeutic value of the of the shows and i saw this sort of community building with it it gave me purpose i said all right i i can serve i can do something to help people uh as i say to change their frame of mind and i'm not a therapist i am not a clergy i have no training whatsoever in in any of these skills but i am a performer <laughs> i do uh, have some years of performing on stage for all kinds of people. And so I, I basically figured out a way with no live in-person audience to make the people on the other side of the phone or the laptop or the screen feel like they're part of a huge live audience spread around the world and made the show interactive. And, um, I think the most profound thing that happened in the second or third week is I started the show and I said, everybody type in the comments, where are you right now? What, what city, what country, where are you? And then I said, how do you feel right now? How do you feel? Are you stressed? Are you lonely? Are you horny? Are you crazy? Are you mm -hmm. tired? What are you? And we got all these crazy responses, like people telling their stories. and and they start responding to each other. 
and then I respond to them. This person lost a parent. This person hasn't seen their their child in months. Very frustrated, but I know that I have purpose that twice a week I can make a difference. Yeah. You've only taken one night off, I think, for Thanksgiving, it seems. That's right. Um, we've done 65 uh, episodes of Tough Cookies. And on top of that, we started a member because the shows are free. Yeah. Um, we started a membership platform on Patreon, patreon.com slash Connie, where I do private performances. For members, I do these group therapy meet and greets. I do horoscopes. We Will does a guitar line thing. Um, I interview all kinds of guests. And so some of the shows are public and free and some of them are private. Every Saturday night, that was always free to everybody in the world. And um, I've, I've performed 65 official shows and at least another 40 private shows. So I've actually performed as much as I would have had I been on tour. That's what I was thinking. That sounds about right. That's wild. You know what the big difference is, though, Alicia, besides yeah. the fact that I'm not traveling? Um, I've covered over 600 songs. I can't even. Okay, so, so let's talk about this. Um, what's been your favorite song that you've covered? My favorite? There have been so many special yeah. moments. And this but... could be whether it's based on performance or thinking you couldn't pull it off. Yeah, oh, well, on the couldn't pull it off <laughs> side, Cardi B. Uh, <laughs> I did Cardi B, be careful. Um, I, you know, I said, you know, I, I think I'm going to do this Cardi B song. And everybody I knew said, you got to be kidding. You got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and when people tell me I can't do something, that's like, that's all I need to hear. Yeah. So I learned... You know, I don't really know these songs. It's weird, Alicia. I have this weird skill where if I've heard something, even if I can't repeat it, it's in there enough that for some reason when I open up my mouth, the essence of it can come out. So this Cardi B song, if you ask me to do it right now, uh, I, although I still have, I want to get married like the Curry stuff in Aisha shit. We more like the Currys, no, 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 you know. Um, I want you to live your life, of course. I hope you get what you're dying for. Be careful of me. Come on. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did that, and it was kind of like in the same. It was like in the same week that we did this hardcore punk song um, called "It's Time to Buy a Futon" by a, a hardcore punk band called SNFU from Canada. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, we're sitting there and we're doing Marvin Gaye and the Supremes and Cardi B and Black Flag and the Misfits all at the same time. And that's over the summer when I realized we could do anything. We yeah. could do anything. I really liked your cover of Technotronics Pump Up the Jam. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's when I started, you know, I figured out I needed something. <laughs> Because it's just me and Will. Yeah. All, I have is, all I have is this piano. And he sits over there and plays guitar. And uh, we, he stamps his foot on a, on a board with a tambourine on his foot. I mean, this is like, this show is put together with duct tape and bubble gum. I love it. I just love that you've been letting fans into your living room two nights a week and that you just kept it up because you saw the value and the power of what music can do for people. Uh, what's life like when you're not doing a live stream besides press stuff? You're like signing well, albums, kissing babies. Well, you know, it's funny because most of my year has been dedicated to this, to this work. And, you know, we, we did a performance at a COVID unit at a hospital in New Jersey, and we've done some outdoor socially distanced community events. Um, so I've been very, very busy with this COVID related performances. But in the midst of that, I put out this double record. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I worked on it for three years, and then all of a sudden it was kind of like the, um, 
the second most important thing that I was going to do. <laughs> and so contrary to popular opinion, putting out a uh, double album in the middle of a global pandemic is a challenge, but it's an extra challenge, Alicia, when you run your own label. See, I never, I never got signed. Uh, so out of my house here, we run Contender Records, which is my record label. And uh, I'll show you, I mean, my time is spent doing a lot of the label work. Mm -hmm. We're like a little ragtag little crew of really just uh, three people. And uh, I basically work seven days a week. Um, but it's all good stuff because the album was very well received. And, it's, and we really broke through some international listeners and fans this year. Um, Germany, Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, uh, UK, the Netherlands, a lot of new international fans. And so I'm busy. I'm just busy. And if I'm not practicing, um, I'm doing press or, you know, like I have a Christmas song coming out in a couple weeks. That was a project that I did uh, that NPR asked me to do. And I had to put that together really quickly. Um, so I'm just kind of in the art bubble, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Is the, the holiday song that you're doing, uh, did, is it an original that you wrote or is it a cover? Yeah. Can you, mm -hmm. are you allowed to say? It's just, uh, there's a program called Morning Edition on NPR. Yeah. Love it. And they asked me to write a Christmas song. Um, so that'll be out the week of Christmas. And so basically I did that last week and then, and that basically started the pr whole process of recording the next album. And then next year I have the, uh, we're going to do a tough cookies, um, album, like a, a best of, mm -hmm. and then in the summer, is the 10th anniversary of my first album, which is called Get Out the Lotion. So there's that coming. And then there's more surprises. And then I got another album that I'm working on that, you know, so it's just kind of like I just pedal to the metal. You're living like the, the musical, the musician's American dream where you're running your label. Things seem to be pretty darn successful for, for where you're at and uh, you're getting so much press and everything. Does this all feel good, especially getting all these wonderful reviews from all over the country? Well, I thank you. You're, yeah. Most of what you're saying is right. But the thing is, I am really, unlike a lot of my peers um, who are in bands or artists that tour, I, I'm like a, a one man wrecking crew in, because we run our own label. And, um, you know, I, I'm a small business owner, basically. Mm -hmm. I employ people. So I have a completely different business model than a lot of my friends who are signed to labels who don't spend their own money and they don't get too much involved with the manufacturing and the promotion and you know just the strategery of the music business but i'm i'm very very involved and i always have been um so we like a lot of small businesses like my friends that run restaurants um or uh, whatever small business um we're always teetering on disaster and covid like so many has put us in very difficult uh position but at the same time we're also being useful yeah you know it's like my friend who runs a a uh, fabric store here in philly um they just pivoted to making masks yeah. and designer masks and things and that's keeping them alive and they're contributing to the community um so that's sort of what we're doing um but we, I spend my own money and I take my own risks to do everything that I do. So I've never, ever been able to get to that point where we feel sturdy. Um, I think that we have 
enough fans and there's enough people in my corner that know I ain't going anywhere. Like mm -hmm. I'm in it to win it. But from a business perspective, it's always like, ooh, it's always like being on a surfboard. Uh, and we don't really have like an advertising budget or whatever. That's why I don't scream it from the rooftops. But when we get, you know, on Rolling Stone's best albums of the year list and things like that, I don't say it to a lot of people, but we're the only independent act on the list. When we hit the Billboard charts the first two weeks of the album, we were the only independent act on that list. Uh, so in order to occupy that space, I just have to work 10 times harder than everybody else. Would you sign to a major label? Um, if, if they were real, if they were true believers. Yeah. The thing is I have had conversations with major labels at certain points, I've been doing Low Cut County nine years. Yeah. In the last three years, there are some people that will come around and kick the tires on me. But so far, every time they either decide not to pursue a deal or they're really hell bent on having me be like somebody else. Um, like I, I was offered a deal where they didn't want me to write my own songs. And um, that was perplexing because I kind of think that that's one of the things that I do well. Yeah. Um, sometimes, not all the time, but I thought it was strange because they said, you're so young and you're so talented and your, your voice and your performance just got to get you a songwriter and I was thinking how how young do you think I am yeah <laughs> um I've been doing this a while but no I I any any situation where I couldn't write my songs would be a difficult one for me to accept yeah. see there's freedom I have a freedom to do whatever I want to do but I also have the burden of having to pay for it all Speaking of like having the freedom to do what you want to do, you've been carving out this year in a major way. I'm kind of like talking to you. My wheels are rolling. Like, I think you need to write a book about this year of quarantine and how you handled it and, and everything. And you could transcribe maybe some of your interviews with like Darlene Love or whatever and put it in there. So that's my free idea for you. <laughs> great. That's a great idea. But, but also if we could dream big, you look at your um, your Thursday nights, your Saturday nights, these tough cookie shows is like a variety show. If we Correct. could aim high, would you want to do that on some level somewhere, even post quarantine? Yes, and that's the plan. I, I think that, well, first of all, thank you. I think that what I'm doing with tough cookies in the live streaming format not only is it different than being on tour and doing concerts, but it's it's maybe more important because it's the future of live entertainment. Yeah. I perform in my house right here with a cell phone and there's people in over 40 countries that, that log in that are involved, that buy my music and contribute and... Um, that says a lot about what the future is. Um, so I, I want to do both things. You know, mm -hmm. I want to tour with the band because there's nothing in the world like being on stage with Low Cut Connie with, with our fans. There's nothing like it. At the same time, I'm, I'm getting addicted to the unscripted variety show uh, format that I've created here. And I would like to do both things. I don't know if the industry has taken enough notice to see that there's a new variety show format sitting right here in front of their face, which is an interactive variety show. Um, in much looser in the format than the current network TV variety shows that we have. Um, I'm at the forefront of that. I don't know if we're gonna be able to convince people that that's worthy of a huge budget and platform but I'm gonna do it anyway. We're gonna still try to have those conversations and you know, I'm gonna still do my work.
Yeah. All right. We're talking about that later offline. Um, so you said with your live streams, you're kind of tapping into your performance art days. Now, I remember you told me a long time ago, you used to perform at a piano bar. What other kind of performance art stuff did you do that informs what you do now? Oh my God, we don't even have time, but you know what? <laughs> okay, two things, one thing. When I first moved to New York City, I went to be an actor slash performance artist, not specifically a musician. I was dancing mm -hmm. and um, I was doing both scripted and, and non-text-based performances um, in New York City. And um, I would get hired uh, to do dance pieces, to do improv, uh, comedy, or uh, all kinds of theater and cabaret shows and underground dance performances. I was involved in a lot of that stuff, but I always knew that music was where I wanted to be, but I had a performance art uh, lens that I was looking through, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so those days uh, in New York City when I was doing that are coming back to me now when I'm doing Tough Cookies. And the thing that was the most thrilling about doing that type of work was working with no script it was always a thrill. It's terrifying. What do you do when you have 60 minutes to fill and you have no plan? Um, it's a totally different muscle group than performing and executing a set list or a script, right? Mm -hmm. They're both, you know, they are, not there isn't one that's superior to the other they're different skills right um i really enjoy this i really enjoy the um creating the show as it goes and and the format of the show as it goes and so it's been an interesting full circle moment for me getting back to my performance art roots i wouldn't say i'm dancing in tough cookies because there's no room in this in this room that I'm in <laughs> I can't really move very far but I'm certainly um moving <laughs> mm -hmm. I know I was thinking about like how much you need to be wearing one of those calculators that can tell like how many calories you're burning and stuff or a Fitbit because you are moving around so much during your performances well, let's talk about your new record for just a little bit before we have to go. So yeah. I was kind of looking at your timeline of your year. October, Private Lives comes out. It's a 17 track record. It's a double album. It's out on your own label. NPR's Fresh Air called it You're Born to Run. It charted on Billboard. And now it's making all these year end lists. That has to feel good, right? It's very validating. It's yeah. not, it's not like my real job is to, to entertain people and to make fans and, and, uh, you know, reach people. But when the industry or at least the critics take notice, it's never bad. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's been nice. It's weird though, Alicia, cause I'm still a cult act. And so, there's a lot of aspects of the entertainment business that have never heard of me um, and won't review my record. Not that they don't like it. They just won't even listen to it or, or review it. We get that a lot. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of always fighting in from the margins. But this record, this year, to have um, such widespread acclaim and from from Rolling Stone and Washington Post and NPR and so many people is it's been really validating because it's it's taken nine years to be um, taken seriously by by a lot of folks. Well, those who know know, and I think that's incredible. And listening to the record, it's it's these stories seemingly about um, different people. And I think I read somewhere that you said you're kind of obsessed with, with hearing about other people's lives and everything and writing about that. Are characters in this on this new album, is it mostly you disguised as others? Is it more fictional? Oh, it's, it's, it's all the above. Yeah, that's but, what you I know, um, 
I, 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 I can't really say specifically, but I think if you follow the trajectory of the records, you'll see that I write about women more and more as I go. Um, not from, you know, not from a male perspective, but trying to get, in, put my eyeballs in the head, in the heads of how women live in the country and get by. Um, I'll never be able to understand how people really live that aren't like me, right? But like there's a song on my last album called Hollywood that's about a homeless person playing playing country songs for tips in Los Angeles on the freeway. Um, I've never lived that life and it's, it's hard for me to relate, but I tried, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I just, um, I find people fascinating and I meet people. I've met people for the 15 years that I've been traveling enough to give me material for a lifetime. I also think Alicia though, there's so many, like of all the music that's out there on the radio and that's, that's popular, not much of it is uh, writing character studies of everyday people. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I was growing up in the 80s, it was an amazing time for pop music. But at the same time, the scope of writing was a lot about cars and getting rich and getting laid. And it was all fairly narrow. Yeah. In that in those kind of early MTV days, pop radio. And I feel like now. And always, this, we are in a little bit of a narrow spectrum with, with popular music. Um, we don't think we are, but I think we are. Uh, I see a lot of recycling when it comes to the, what type of people, the demographics of people that people are writing for, you know? And um, so I just kind of make it my mission to write for the people that don't get written for, if that makes sense. The um, underdogs yeah sure yeah um and also there's a lot on this album about and a lot of my albums about people that didn't make it <laughs> um and what do you do what do you do if you're if you're a loser in a sense what do you do if you had a dream or an ambition or the way you wanted your life to go and it didn't go that way what do you do then and there's a lot of that on this Private Lives album. That's not a sexy topic that most people write about, but I, I do a lot. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I really enjoyed the album. I, like, I do like the song that you wrote about the woman, Sharice. Yeah. On there. And that's such a cool name also. And I love the final song on the record as well. That one kind of gets me like because I know it's like the final song on the album and so everything's like building up and then it just sort of like, um, you know. It's called Stay As Long As You Like and yeah. um, I think it's my favorite too. And it's sort of become the um, unofficial theme song of the Tough Cookies show. Yeah. Because the song and a lot of the songs I try to acknowledge <clears throat> that people are going through stuff and we don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring. Mm -hmm. We don't know. I wrote that uh, Stay As Long As You Like. There's an artist from Louisiana that I love whose name was Amade Ardouin. Hmm. He was really the, he was a Creole musician in the 1920s and the early 30s. And he sang in French, black man who sang in French played accordion and sang, and his music is so soulful, it's spine tingling. It's, uh, you know, what became Zydeco later, but mm -hmm. it was really just, I mean, they wouldn't have had a name for it at the time. And he died on very, you know, he had a very tragic life and faced racism and hurricanes and he was beaten, uh, he, he was, hired to perform at a white sort of uh, society party and then he was beaten on the way home and left to die and and i was just listening to his music and i just i basically wrote a song for his voice like uh if you're living 
in a situation in a Jim Crow South uh, or, or in a place where there's all these natural disasters, you don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring. You may not survive. And yet people find a way to not just survive, but to find, to party, to find joy. Mm -hmm. Right here, right now. And so I tried to put all that into Stay As Long As You Like. I'm glad you like that song. Yeah, it was like a perfect ending to the album, which we should, we should start wrapping up because I know that, uh, I know that you're a busy, uh, bis small business owner. You probably have some, uh, some Polaroids to take and to autograph. I got to mention, Lil Cook Connie has rad merch from like uh, boxing gloves. <laughs> you got some? Oh, the yarmulke. Oh, mazel tov to that. And, um, and you have like your ripped white undershirts, undies. I almost wore some merch today. Um, but then I thought it would be embarrassing if I wore How about this little The spritz. Yes, the scent. What does it smell like? Like it, hope. Oh. Uh, and that. Oh, God. It smells like um, hope. <laughs> it smells like intrigue. It smells like espionage. Ah, okay. Private okay. Lives, the new unisex organic fragrance by Low Cut Connie. The people are going nuts over it. It is a citrus-based organic fragrance that my friend made in Canada. and pe People love it. All right, that's what I'm getting myself for Christmas then. There's a lot of rad merch on Low Cut Connie's website, including just buying the darn new record. You can also stream it anywhere and tune in for Tough Cookies. You can support them on Patreon or just watch the free live streams. It truly will fill you up, rock you out. And um, Adam, thank you so much for taking this time to hang out with, uh, with us in Denver, Colorado. We sure miss no, you. No, no, no. It's my pleasure. I love you guys. I love Colorado. I love Indy 1023. You guys were my partners. One of my partners on my Connie Club radio show, which I hope to do again. I can't wait to be out there with you all celebrating the end to this pandemic. Whenever it comes, we just got to be safe, smart, and careful until then. And everybody that's watching and listening, just take care of yourselves. Don't get discouraged. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. And uh, I will see you on the flip. Mwah. Amen.